It's a great honor and a pleasure to introduce Professor Manda Kranter Bose, who's going to present this lecture. Manda Kranter studied in Oxford and Calcutta. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and she's Professor Emirata at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She taught in the Religious Studies Department there for many years and has been the director for the Center of the Center for India and South Asia Research at that university. She's got a wide range of interests and publications over, over the years. She's, uh, um, she's a philologist, a scholar of Sanskrit, and she's done critical editions of two musicological texts. And she's also written on the Ramayana and um, on gender and Hinduism more generally. So among her publications are A Woman's Ramayana, and she's also written um, Women in the Hindu Tradition. And more recently, she's produced a very important book, uh, edited a very important book called The Goddess in the Oxford um, History of Hinduism series. So I'm very pleased and honored to welcome and to introduce uh, Manda Kranter, who's going to give a lecture on divinity and femininity, Shakti in the world. Over to you, Manda Kranter. Divinity and femininity, Shakti in the world. I offer this talk somewhat tentatively because I have little knowledge of Shakti other than what I have gathered from the basic texts and from talking to colleagues. I have, however, thought at length about how the idea of the feminine divine has been recited from heaven to earth to shape women's lives. Jack Holly is perhaps over enthusiastic in declaring that the history of Hindu tradition can be seen as a re-emergence of the feminine in his 1996 book. But the feminine is indeed fundamental and pervasive in Hindu belief and practice. In this talk, I will try to present some of these thoughts and formulate some questions to which I am looking for answers. My explorations begin with my understanding that from the post Indus Valley era, when the Hindu religion became systematized in concept and practice, it attempted to explain the origin of existence, followed by an attempt to authorize an account of the present drawn from the past. In other words, an attempt to historicize existence. I'm particularly intrigued and in a sense comforted by the acknowledgement that lies at the very center of Hinduism's self-exploration, the origin that the origin of existence is not really known and perhaps can, can never be known. The Nasadiya Sukta of the Rig Veda expresses the tentative hope that yam yam yato abhuva. Yadi Vabhute, Yadi Vala. Your Asyadhyaksha Parami Voman, so Anga Veda, Yadi Na Veda. He, the first origin of this creation, whether he formed it all or did not form it, whose eye controls this world in highest heaven, he verily knows it, or perhaps he knows not. The negation with which the verse above ends is devastating. Is that what the Hiranyagarbha Sukta account of creation was leading up to when every item of the description of the manifest comes, cosmos ended with uncertainty about the being responsible? The one who should be adored with our oblation which follows the Nasabhya Sutta. It seems, con seems confident in describing creation, but we see that it describes the process, not the cause of creation, and does not, cannot identify the cause. The Vedic seers are nevertheless confident 
in affirming their belief in the power that drives the universe in the key meaning that power is feminine. The Devi Sukta unambiguously claims, I am the queen, the gatherer up of treasures, most thoughtful, first of those who merit worship. I concede though, that this confident and self-assertion may have something to do with the fact that the hymn was composed by Amrini, a female seer. In general, the sages seem to have got over their uncertainty, exciting as it is, and by further speculative, but more assertive thought arrived at axiomatic statements about the creation and unfolding of the cosmos by means of successive divisions of the initial unity. Their view of the origin of creation takes a biological turn at this point. By making gender splitting the starting point of the processes, not only of the physical world, but also of the imagined world of spirit. We see here a switch of methodology from metaphysical speculation to biological analogy, overlaid with poetical rhetoric. The implications of this biological analogy suggest that even metaphysical speculation is bent to serve material causality, leading to pragmatic political approaches to gender values including views of women's existence, one forever bound to human society's jurisdiction. I raise this issue because it shows that the feminine aspect of divinity is inextricably tied to earthly femininity, the goddess to women. Hindu beliefs and practices have been imbued with the idea of womanhood, locating the feminine both in the material human world and in the realm of the spirit. How much force that tradition still exerts on Hindu social culture today with respect to women is a question that can lead to emotionally charged positions, whereby religious principles are turned into social and political rules. Particularly open to debate are the opportunities said to exist within the Hindu religion for women to achieve self-determination, both socially and spiritually. Those opportunities would seem in principle to follow smoothly from the acceptance of a feminine divinity possessing power that is both unlimited and unbounded, which implies absolute independence. Any parallel between such a divinity and mortal females is patently absurd, if only in recognition of physical reality, but it can leave a mark on the ideology of social liberation. A starting point of that ideology is the acceptance of a fundamental ambivalence. The divine feminine is central to Hindu theology while the human feminine has been systematically devalued through the history of Hinduism. I beg your patience for my re recapitulation of that history, for I need to keep my tracks through it clear. The history begins with the invention of gods and goddesses. At once we notice two things. First, we are back to biology because a gender division within the community of deities makes them biological entities. Their special powers notwithstanding, and second, they are placed in a hierarchy of capabilities and responsibilities. While the gods controlled structural cosmic forces and functions, such as the power of the wind, oceans, water, fire, thunder and lightning, the goddesses were players in the support system of the universe rather than its controllers, carrying out a primarily nurturing role. From an early time, the gender division within the divine world determined the division of divine functions. 
with the broader, far-reaching control of creation, resting upon male gods, while the female gods carried out the housekeeping tasks of keeping cre creation going. Another aspect of the gendering of deities is that goddesses were scarcely, if ever, independent actors but attached to gods in supporting roles. Any independence that some of the, them might have possessed initially eroded as the conception of the divini, di, divine community formed up through time. In the Vedic period, we find goddesses pushed to the periphery of power and influence. For sages and worshippers, goddesses diminished in importance in comparison to male deities such as Indra, Agni, Vayu, or Soma who were the principal gods of the time. Although we must not underestimate the importance of Vedic goddesses as philosophical notions or as objects of practical veneration, we do have to recognize their limitations. While the gods were controllers of the elemental constituents of the universe, the goddesses were nurturers, protectors, purifiers, energy givers, and mothers as we may see in the profiles of the Vedic goddesses. The most prominent goddesses of the early Vedic period were Ushas, Prithivi, Aditi, Saraswati, Vaj, Sri, Lakshmi. But none of them at that point of Hindu theological history was explicitly associated with the idea of Shakti. It was not till later times that Saraswati and Lakshmi became representations of the idea. Lakshmi in particular became the focal point of an entire tantra and the ultimate power of creation in one stream of theology known as the Pancharatra school of thought. Even before the advent of such traditions, though not in the earliest times, the idea of the feminine divine as the supreme activator of creation had taken firm root in Hindu thought. And the idea of Devi, the great goddess, had begun to do dominate the religious life of the Hindus. The essence of that figure, the creative and motivating energy of creation, Shakti, was inherent in every god but subject to none. This elevation of the feminine was muted in the Vedic period. Although the Vedic seers also sensed the presence of a divine feminine of all pervasive power, power. From about the third century of the common era, she came to be known as Mahadevi, the great goddess, or simply as Devi, to whom the Hindu seers attributed all the powers and characteristics of all goddesses and identified her as the cause of creation and the greatest of all divinities. Devi thus came to be idealized as a single goddess who is the sum of all other goddesses and also of the essential energy individually inherent in male divinities. So inconceivably, Greater power can be made comprehensible only by describing her material acts, which signify her attributes in terms that are relevant to human life. Given the breadth of Devi's powers and functions, multiplying the items of description is the necessary method, which require textual strategies such as narrative plots punctuated by long lists of Devi's powers while invoking her presence and blessings. The Markandeya Purana offers the perfect example. Not only does it tell a fast moving story of Devi's battle to save the creation, it also attempts to comprehend who she is by listing what she does. Her essence thus captured in terms of her concrete, visible existence. This is what the Devi Mahatmya section of the Markandeya Purana tries to achieve. 
ಧಾರ್ಯತೆ ವಿಶ್ವ ತ್ವಯಿತ್ಯತೆ ಜಗತ್ ತ್ವಯಿತ್ಪಾಲ್ಯತೆ ದೇವಿ ತಮತ್ಸ್ಯಂತೆ ಸರ್ವತ ಬೈ ಯೂ ದಿಸ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಹೋಮ್ ಬೋರ್ನ್ ಬೈ ಯೂ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ಯೂ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಓ ದೇವಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಕನ್ಸ್ಯೂಮ್ ಇಟ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಸಪ್ಲಿಮೆಂಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ಅ ಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಅಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಟ್ಸ್ ತ್ವಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಸ್ವಂ ಈಶ್ವರಿ ತ್ವಂ ಹ್ರೀಂ ಸ್ವಂ ಬುದ್ಧಿರ್ ಬೋಧಲಕ್ಷಣ ಲಜ್ಜಾ ಪುಷ್ಟಿ ಯು ಆರ್ ದ ಗಾಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಗುಡ್ ಫಾರ್ಚ್ಯೂನ್ ದ ರೂಲರ್ ಮಾಡೆಸ್ಟಿ ಇಂಟೆಲಿಜೆನ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರೈಸ್ ಬೈ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಬ್ಯಾಶ್ಫುಲ್ನೆಸ್ ನಾರಿಶ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಕಂಟೆನ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಟ್ರ್ಯಾಂಕ್ವಿಲಿಟಿ ಫಾರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ಲಿ ದ ದಿಸ್ ಡಿವಿನಿಟಿ ಇಸ್ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ರಿಹೆನ್ಸಿಬಲ್ ಇನ್ ಪರ್ಸನಿಫೈಡ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡಿಂಗ್ human rules she is power personified shakti roopi mother matri roopi wife sahadharmini and even daughter kanya roopi not surprisingly it is the role of mother that appeals most of the devotee as well as a well known prayer to durga shows ya devi sarvabhute shri matri roopi na sangsita to the devi who abides in all living beings as mother i bow to her i bow to her i bow to her i salute her the crucial element in this statement is not so much the adoration of her but the claim upon the goddess for her protection and nurture of her child the worshiper but the feminization of the protective powers of the universe has another side to it which is not so reassuring even when it is exercised as a defensive measure feminine force may seem to be transgressive very likely to go out of hand female violence cannot be overlooked because it is terrifying even when it is a shield against demons imagined as it is as the menace of kali and her likes women centered as the myth is it is brought under convention of patriarchal social organization and control when shiva places himself under kali's dancing feet to prevent their drumming from tearing the universe to piece pieces let us note that kali's action is at once protective and destructive protective because it counters threat to creation and destructive because it extends any relation to creation as well the transformation of mother into child eater is not a thought that can be contained within social relationships the way out of this fear has been to reform kali as a nurturing feminine power in human life a position culturally negotiated through image word and sound as a protector of creation kali is a fearsome goddess a grinning skeletal figure surrounded by corpses this terrifying being is reconstituted as a full bodied queenly young woman in a sea of red hibiscus grace and mercy to in her wild hair to borrow the title of 18th century bengali poet ram prasad sen's songs translated by leonard nethan and clip sin violent as this female divinity is she comes to be domesticated ever even as her mystery is elaborated in order to keep her power in violet bringing her into the devotee's family becomes a devotional strategy worked out most effectively through words ram prasad sings you will find mother in any house do i dare say it in public she is bhairavi shiva 
Durga with her children, Sita with Lakshmana. She's mother, daughter, wife, sister, every woman close to you. What more can Ram Prasad say? You work the rest out from this limb. It hints. Even the most horrific signifiers of our violence are turned into play objects. She's playing in my heart. Whatever I think, I think her name. I close my eyes and she is in there, garlanded with human heads. Common sense, know how, go on. So they say I'm crazy, let them. All I ask my crazy mother is that you stay put. More complex than, than this personal relationship is the institutionalized location of Devi within the family, of which the most elaborate example is the Durga Puja festival of Bengal and other parts of Eastern India. Although Durga is a warrior goddess, though of gentle aspect, for her present day devotees, she embodies mainly the life affirming nurturing aspect of the greatest goddess and is approached as a devotee's mother. Her motherly persona is confirmed effectively through the visual strategy of presenting her in a family group made up of her children, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Ganesha, and Kartikeya. And this is paralleled by the textual strategy of the legend that this is her visit to her natal home on earth with her children on leave, as it were, from her husband, she was housewife. Just as women on earth do. Necessary that divine family is traditionally represented in a tight group with the figures positioned as in this photo. No content, not content with this affirmation of the goddesses location within the traditional family structure. Some recent artists have tried to make Durga's motherly identity even more explicit as in the next image. Here, the goddess appears in the iconic Bengali domestic apparel. A red bordered white sari, white conch shell and red coral bangles on her wrists, minimum jewelry with a cute baby Ganesha in her arms. To hammer the message of her motherly nature, the sculptor has carefully removed every weapon from her 10 arms. But does this not also force the great goddess into social compliance? If she's just your average housewife and mother, then is she not more of a manageable female than the classical conception of the great goddess. There is reason for my suspicion. As cultural forms are consistently exploited in all societies to control women and manipulating them into accepting subjugation as empowerment. Women's deification does come at a political cost. Centering womanhood. As against that suspicion, we may hold up theological assertions of the organic bond between Shakti and women. The vision of divinity as the feminine principle became both broader and sharper with the advent and growth of tantric theology. Especially important in the context of gender is the tantric view that not only is the goddess the power that creates, protects, and nurtures existence, but that she is also inherent in every woman. Several late texts succinctly state Tavasarpa Namani Jagati Achanna Vigraha. Every woman, oh goddess, is your very form. This appears in Mani Balakantra. Kulanava Tantra again says, Ya kachi di angana loke matri kula sambhava. Every woman is born in the family of the great mother. In other words, the tantric view holds every woman 
to be part of Shakti, even if in, in an unrealized state of consciousness. This elevation of women in Tantra is of a higher order than the position taken in other worship regimes of Devi, in which the goddess is not literally equated with women, although at times they may be vehicles of our spirit. For instance, an important part of the worship ritual of Durga is Kumari Puja, which is a worship of prepubescent girls, usually very young children, in whom Devi is thought to be present, but just for the duration of the ritual. Sometimes this is a long ritual in itself, at which a number of girls are worshipped together. A notable example being the worship of hundreds of such vehicles of the goddess at the Adhyapit temple near Kolkata. The little girls are sitting here in row after row, dressed up as goddesses in silk saris and crowns, with adult women facing them with reverently folded hands. The scale of this ritual is scarcely attempted at other locations, but the ritual remains the same, even with just one Kumari, the Virgin Goddess. Nepal has an ancient tradition in electing prepubescent girls as ruling deities of certain temples who go through a far more complex and extended ritual observed during their tenure coming to an end on reaching puberty. Kumari Puja honors the temporary presence of the goddess in woman, but only in prepubescent girls who are considered untainted by their sexual potential. On the contrary, Tantra does not see any woman ever separated from Shakti, even though Tantra does not literally defy mortal females. Given the spiritual importance of femininity, the devotee approaches the intangible idea of Shakti by focusing on her tangible manifestations as particular goddesses, whether as gentle, loving, and beneficial figures like Lalita Tripura Sundari and Lakshmi, or fierce, violence, bronze goddesses like Kali or Chandi. Whichever route you follow, if you are a Hindu, you have to look to women for connecting with Devi. In Tantrism, not only are women essential to the process, but they are also regarded as the most effective initiation into the sacred processes, initiators to the sacred processes, sorry, especially the mother of the seeker. Does this belief grant women any active capability in the world as Davis representative. In social life as it stands, such acknowledgement is doubtful, but even a theoretical elevation of women does provide them with a base for self-esteem and self-assertion. It is a deeply empowering religious assurance for women to receive the tantric assertion that Devi is a sum of all women and that every woman is part of an unbounded femininity endowed with unbounded power. The idea that Devi is present in every woman is especially comforting in the family context. Since the safety and well-being of the family is considered a primary need, it is, not, it is most reassuring for both men and women that these benefits are available from so great a power as Devi, then the that the power of the divine feminine is implicit in mortal women who are located within their human family. This potential is instinctively recognizable as unbreachable because it is rooted in biological identity. True that, this belief results only infrequently in practical reverence or even sympathetic consideration for women in the Hindu world, but exists nevertheless and is reassuring, at least emotionally. In a practical sense, that reassurance 
can be believable, given that within human reach exist women, each a part of Devi to dispense help, no matter in how big or small a way. What follows from this position is at once empowering and exploitative for women, exploitative for women. In Goddess Durga, if Goddess Durga is to be looked upon for supporting my life, may I not call upon mortal women for similar aid? This is the expectation that makes service to others the justification of women's lives and does so on the grounds of religious faith. It is not for, for nothing that a caring, prudent and efficient wife is so often addressed as Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity. For students of the Hindu religion, the move from theology to sociology is thus seamlessly executed. No su surprise that then through the, its long history, the Hindu religion has shaped the life of women. The divine feminine in human life. Summarizing the discussion so far, we can say that femininity is central to Hinduism. The Hindus' belief in the idea of divine feminine broadly termed Devi, and that Devi is at once a philosophical unity immanent in many personifications distributed across archetypal roles as protector, defender, scourge of evil, destroyer, nurturer, mother, helpmeet, wife, daughter. As you think about these roles, you can see how readily the last two categories, that is nurturer, mother, helpmeet, wife, daughter, can be transferred from the divine to the human realm. And how usefully, especially when the nurturing roles are made secure by the first two. This is not to deny or minimize how profound the conception of the goddess is as a philosophical abstraction, taken in itself and placed at the very core of existence as the motivating energy that holds together all existence. It also signals to us the theological complexity of a metaphysical construction that at the same time underwrites actions in the physical world. Human beings venerate power, even power terrifying in its intensity, so long as that power acts in human interest. That is when theological thinking merges with social and political impulses working in the human world. The advantages of that Convergence appear clearly from the myths of the protector goddesses. The battles that Durga and Kali fight are cosmic, but their benefits accrue to humanity. The might of the goddess can also provide women with personal confidence. Besides, being a source of an almost infinite range of philosophical adventure, the conception of this feminine power ruling over all existence and experience holds the potential for women to claim self-determination as human repositories of Devi's energy. Since Devi controls everything, a woman may well see her work in the world as her self-chosen exercise of power rather than labor forced upon her, especially as she may think that Devi's all encompassing array of attributes is implicated in a woman's work. The variety of Devi's perceived functions is still in its mix of solving the essential needs of human life, which may well resonate with a woman's understanding of her responsibilities, the nurture of her family and the protection of her children. So socializing the goddess, the argument. In theory, the link between divinity and womanhood presumed in Hindu thought may be viewed and extolled 
as an empowering assertion. But when we shift the view from philosophical theory to worldly practice, we have to take the empowerment as best as selective in worldly life. No woman can exercise the might that Durga or Kali leads, nor can, can the ferocity of a warrior goddess be welcome in a well-ordered society. If protective violence is taken off the table of what women are expected to do, then they are left with tasks of nurturing life and maintaining its orderly unfolding. The transition from cosmic arena to the social is thus made both unchallengeable and necessary. For women, dedicating oneself to a supporting role in society becomes a religious duty enjoined upon them by the innumerable accounts and representation of Devi's presence in the world. The hierarchy of powers and functions that characterizes Devi's action fits well with the idea of stratified social functions of women. Socializing the goddess strategies, elaborated through legend, iconography, and ritual. The goddess paradigm covers a wide range of identities that translate smoothly to, idea, to ideal types of, by which women can be defined and their roles in life prescribed. Tracy Pinchman rightly urges us to examine how structures pertaining to the goddess may help shape conceptions of the female gender. The treatment of women in Hindu society and the roles of that women are assigned. Because of their influence, goddesses are potent and ready models for idealizing women, which facilitates the leveling of women in their social relations. The major goddesses are personification of the virtues that Hindus wish to see in women. The most important of these wish fulfilling models is Lakshmi, because she is the goddess of wealth and social stability, as well as the consort of Lord Vishnu. Thus, capable of protecting the orderly prosperity of the world. No praise for a Hindu woman is higher than that of being called Lakshmi, whether she is a dutiful daughter or a newly married bride, or a housewife of proven service to her family. It helps if she is also beautiful, as Lakshmi is. A woman of learning gifted in art or music is admired as Saraswati, and may be awarded that name as a title. That wealth and knowledge, the most desirable social goods should be considered the province of female deities suggests that there is indeed space in Hinduism for revering womanhood. To underline the value of such a benevolent figure, a contrast is of offered in the exact opposite of the Lakshmi model, the malicious persona of a Lakshmi, who infects families with Envy and brings about disputes, ill fortune, and destitution. She's everything a woman must not be, and thus an explanation of female mischief. Lakshmi, on the other hand, gives the world just what it wants wealth, peace, order. What is more, as Vishnu's beloved consort, she shares in his power to impose stability upon the world bestow all the benefits that her devotees seek and intercede for them with him and even prove to be a channel to Vishnu and his liberating grace. But in the medieval era, her status outgrew even Vishnu's when she was equated with the all abstraction termed Shakti and viewed as God's Shakti with knowledge bliss and activity, the subsistence of the absolutely existing God, his essential nature, 
the divine presence as some Yukta Gupta Samsa, the Tartanets of the Lakshmi Tantra, composed between 9th and 12th centuries. Like the, the Devi Mahatmya, this text glorifies women in general as beings created in the cherished form of Lakshmi. And it advocates them, them their worship. It is unlikely that any woman might reach this level of adoration, but the mere possibility may serve as an energizing idea for women today in their efforts at gender validation in the social real politic. Such casting of women in the goddess mold is reflected in the naming of girls in the hope of gaining for them an auspicious life. Lakshmi, Sri, Kamala, Padma, Saraswati have popular names for girls for a long time, though not as much today. The hope attached to such names may ever gain strength and center on a particular woman in a crisis during the 1971 India-Pakistan war over the emergence of a free Bangladesh. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi of India was not only fated as Mother Durga in populist publications, but also pictured as the goddess in calendar art. On the other hand, even if a girl child name is named Lakali, expecting her to act as Kali is unheard of. He would want a fierce, who would want a fierce and destructive, and more to the point, uncontrollable female in the family. Exceptions are those holy men who have stepped out, holy women who have stepped out social roles of social roles and obligations in their devotion to Kali. Unlike those who similarly dedicated themselves in, to the benign Krishna, these women are held in both awe and fear as outsiders. But even in Kali, Hindus have ready model for critical occasions. Rani Rashman was an immensely wealthy Hindu widow, famous for her beauty, piousness, charity, and a very successful running feud with the British. On one occasion, when some drunk British soldiers or sailors attempted to force their way into her palatial home in Calcutta, Rashmani was reputed to have emerged from her quarters, waving the cutlass of Kali from her palace temple, thereby putting the goddess, godless foreigners to rout and earning reverence as Mother Kali personified. True or not, what mattered was that everyone believed the tale to the Rani's huge credit. In Hindu society, the highest respect one can pay a woman is to call her Devi. Barely a step down in the practice of addressing a woman is mo as mother. This usage is of particular value to Hindus and of common currency in India, sometimes extending even to non-Hindus. Whether such terms of exaltations are true indicators of Indian women's actual position in their world is a different matter. On the surface of social interchange, these usages denote reverence, but looking deeper into the social function, one may be inclined to see this is a strategy to keep women bound within prescribed roles. <coughs> Facilitating their marginalization for a Devi is by definition written on out of common human attract, uh, interactions. Should we not ask where this ceremony of respect leaves a woman? Has it not written her out of common life, marginalized her socially by putting her on a pedestal? Can a Devi be a part of a human family and of human society. A tragic example of that alienation is the fate of a young woman in Satyajit Rai's film Devi. 
She's led to believe that she is the great goddess in human form. Reality strikes when she finds that she has no power to give life to a dying child. She is stranded on the margin of life with her sanity gone and her faith replaced by despair at realizing that she is neither a goddess nor part of a human family. Heartbreaking as this demonstration may be of the pressure of religious belief on a woman, it should not be taken as women's in inevitable experience within the Hindu faith fold. It would also be an exaggeration to say that requiring women to provide self-defying service, self-denying de 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 service, sorry, to other plant, others plunges them into subject, abject slavery, or that such is the unvarying expectation of a patriarchal society from a woman. Ambiguity and contradiction mark every area of Hindu construction of womanhood, as indeed they do everything else in Hindu thought. The widely varying definitions of womankind in Hindu religious culture through centuries include denigration and subjugation on the one hand and admiration and acceptance of autonomy on the other. For example, Saraswati's independence has not diminished her stature as a sacred being or as the deity to turn to for success as a student or artist. Among humankind, non-conformist women such as Mahadevi Akka or Mirabai are not reviled but venerated even though Akka abandoned court clothing and Mira abandoned her husband. There is indeed space in Hindu society to be claimed by women as their own. Though it may have shrunk microscopically. Even so, within the dynamics of family and personal relationships in Hindu society, women have room for both self-assertion and self-determination. The biological authority of a mother, for instance, validates her rule over her children, at least for a while. The Mahabharata provides the authority. Tesham pita yatha swami tatha mata na samshaya. Just as the father is the master of his sons, so is the mother. There is no doubt about that. Even wives and daughters who are fairly low on the scale of domestic influence may wield some power of authority in context of moral conduct, given the vestiges of sacred power she retains as a legacy from Devi. An ideal wife is expected to be submissive to her husband and senior members of the family, including senior members, female members, but she may well urge right conduct and even argue for observance. Modernity obviously has changed and enlarged women's social space, but there are also precedent-setting narratives from the past. For instance, in the Ramayana, Sita insists on accompanying her husband Rama into exile against his specific instructions to stay home with ethical arguments. And he concedes the point. Later in the epic, she cautions him against the lure of arms and counsels him to give up a warrior's violent occupation in favor of the gentle life of a forest dwelling hermit. Here again, she's hard out with serious consideration, but here she fades. Her morality subordinate to Rama's pragmatism which is an indication of women's subordinate role in society. One rationalized by arbitrary expectation that they fit themselves to the profile of feminine nature drawn on the traits admired in core goddesses. Those traits one cannot help suspecting are wishful idealizations of what men want in women but moderated by the need to keep women 
goddess or not, under control. Because of the need, women's presumed share in the sacred power of Devi has been easy to ignore. At the same time, the patriarchal compulsion to subjugate women has made it necessary to cast women as creatures of a lower intellectual and moral order. Setting us out for practical social purposes, the goddess women link. But the link is there for the finding. And ironically, it is within Hindu religious orthodoxy that it can be found and invoked by taking such scriptural authorities as the Devi Mahatmya and Devi Bhagavata Purana, literally. Conservative believers might be asked why they revere the Devi Bhagavata Purana as holy, yet disregard in its assertion that Devi resides in every woman, making every woman an object of reverence. Perhaps the key to unlocking women from restrictions purportedly sanctioned by the Hindu religion is to search for the key within the principles of religion. That search would succeed best in the Hindu religion when not rejected in favor of a secular political approach, but undertaken with respect, critical respect, certainly for faith in an inalienable relationship imagined between humanity and the divine feminine. Perhaps the most potent form of that imagined relationship to the conception of Devi as the devotee's daughter, a playful girl. Here is a story from Bengal. In a village, there was a temple to goddess Kali, whose worship was devoutly performed by the village priest. One day, a seller of conchal bangles came to the village, going from door to door, finding none to buy his wares until a little girl came out and asked for bangles. The bangles fitted her tiny wrists perfectly, pleasing both her and the bangle seller. When he asked for payment, she told him she was going to the village tank for bathing, but her father, the priest, would pay. Satisfied, the bangle seller sought out the priest who, however, did not believe him, saying that he didn't have a daughter. Insisting that he did put bangles on that child's wrist, the bangle seller led the priest to the village tank. No guard was there. Desperate to prove himself truthful, the bangle seller cried out, Mother, tell him I am not lying. From the waters of the tank arose two small arms each ornamented with the bangles. The priest fell to knees, crying, Mother, you never granted me the boon of seeing you after a long lifetime of worship. And now you come in answer to this unlettered man's call just because he asked. Such is the play of Devi's Maya. Little can be said after this because I suspect the heart supersedes the bar brain. So I will leave my subject with the comforting thought that Hindus can and do the moral mortal female in the feminine, the feminine divine, whether the instinct finds expression in worldly empathy, love and justice for women is for believers to ensure. Thank you.